All right, hello and welcome to the Pro Baseball World Tour. My name is Rick Crabb. Joining me as always, my co-host, Mr. Eric Marinback from his palatial state in the greater New York area, soon to be running for ambassador to Taiwan. Eric, thanks for joining us again. How you doing? I'm doing very well, and yourself? Oh, not bad. Just actually pretty good. We've got a lot of news to talk about. Most of it good, some of it bad, but even the bad's kind of comical, as we'll get into it. All right. And we'll start, since we're based in North America, we will start with North America, and lately that's been where a lot of the not-so-positive news have come from. And, of course, yet another team had players test positive for the COVID-19. The St. Louis Cardinals finally get back on the field, and now we have to contend with two members of the Cincinnati Reds, who had to cancel two games with the Pittsburgh Pirates as a result of this. My goodness. I mean, I don't know, it kind of reminds me almost of what Rodney King said, is, or can't we all get along? It's kind of like, people, can't we all just stay away from the COVID? What the heck's going on here? <laughs> I, I would love to know who or what actually uh, transpired that kind of went up to it. Because as far as I know, the numbers, Ohio hadn't hit that badly, okay. other than one of the politicians. Uh, well, so yeah. I don't know where any of the Reds could have mm-hmm. gotten it from, whether it was in Cincinnati or whether it was mm-hmm. in another spot. Well, I have an answer but for you for that. Hip- According because to of the HIPAA laws, you'll never find that out. I'm sorry? But because of the HIPAA laws, you'll never find that out. Right. Well, here's what the Associated Press and NBC Sports had to say about this as of the 15th, which was yesterday afternoon, our time, 3 o'clock. The Cincinnati Reds became the third Major League Baseball team to have games called off because one of its players tested positive for COVID-19. The last two games of a series between the Reds and Pittsburgh Pirates at Great American Ballpark were postponed Saturday after one Cincinnati player tested positive. The Reds joined the Marlins and Cardinals with games called off because of positive tests on their roster, creating a ripple effect through the schedule that has limited some teams to a handful of games. Major League Baseball was awaiting further test results and doing contact tracing to gauge the extent of the concerns. The Reds had one player sidelined earlier this season after a COVID-19 test that later turned out to be a false positive. Matt Davidson tested positive during the opening series of the abbreviated 60-game season and went on the injured list. Later tests cleared him. Three other Reds Jody Votto, Mike Moustakis, and Nick Sensel missed games after feeling sick but tested negative for the coronavirus and rejoined the team. It was more unplanned timed off for the Pirates who opened the week with a three-game series against the Cardinals postponed. They split the first two games of their series with the Reds. MLB postponed the rest of the series seven hours before the scheduled first pitch on Saturday night. Both teams are off Monday. The Reds have already played one seven-inning makeup doubleheader this season, necessitated by a rainout. Rescheduling because of the coronavirus has resulted in a wide range of games played by MLB teams. St. Louis, resu- excuse me, St. Louis resumed Saturday in Chicago against the White Sox after a 17-day pause. The Cardinals had played a total of five games, fewest by any team in the majors. By comparison, a dozen teams had played at least 20 games. The Cardinals had a coronavirus outbreak that spread to 18 members of the organization. Miami had the first outbreak. Let's see. I think they're... Okay, that was the last paragraph. It's redundant. We spoke about that the last two weeks. So so now the Cincinnati Reds are the latest team to be hit. And seems like, I don't know, the Pirates might be worried. They might have some issues with that as well. Mm, every week with this, Eric. Good God. That's where I'd love to know about the testing themselves. I mean, there have been a lot of doubts being placed on the actual tests, mm-hmm. the turnaround time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Especially after the one story came out where in Philadelphia there was a false positive. Mm. My theory is 
for every false positive, there's a false negative. Right. So you don't know the validity of these tests, how they're being administered, what type of tests are being administered. And again, I have to do with the HIPAA laws, but... So until we can come to a system where we can actually get this down universally, mm -hmm. there's no answer. Right. And I I have friends who work for different hospitals here in the Baltimore area. I have a few that work in Hopkins and a couple that work in some other hospitals, too. And they told right. me when they were give, given tests themselves for their own jobs, the different hospitals vary with their tests. Now, they have some that just do like kind of like the swab inside the cheek, and then they have one where they literally run the tube up the sinus cavity, which is more accurate, but obviously more painful and intrusive test. I'm wondering if they're if these teams and these trainers are varying with that, whether they're using area hospitals with just a swab or just the you know the sinus test, for lack of a better term, or I'm one, I'm I'm kind of surprised that any of these leagues, uh, maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm kind of surprised that these leagues aren't agreed upon as far as like okay, we will use this contractor, this hospital, these protocols, this everything. I mean, it seems like. They try to do, they have like these rules with the bubbles and everything, and even Major League Baseball, it seemed like they were on board with a certain amount of rules after they had to go back and forth with the players' union, but I don't know. I'm wondering if that's a case of it too, Eric, whether it's more than one type of COVID test being used. It also has to do with turnaround time. I mean, these tests that are supposedly coming out that are well, within 15 minutes of each other, are they as accurate as the ones that take a week or so to get the results back? Right. You don't know which is more accurate than the other. You also don't know when these guys have it and get rid of it. I actually am thinking, even though it could be way out of line here, but these guys that are getting it, how come they're not being tested for antibodies as well, which also seems to be a big deal mm -hmm. around the world these days, the antibody tests and all the other different tests to right. try and work up a vaccine or whatever? Well, Why aren't um, these guys getting tested for that? Yeah. I mean, I'm by no means a doctor. I, I don't know your work experience with that. I'm guessing that's, that's the same with you. Um, I'm wondering if the uh, yeah I'm wondering that as well, and I'm wondering if there are other tests that aren't being publicized. Maybe they are testing for the antibodies. Maybe they're not. Maybe it's a cost-effective situation. I hope that's not the case. I mean, especially with these leagues. I mean, Major League Baseball, NFL, um, NBA. They should be. They, they should be yeah, they've got, spending everything. You they've know. got money coming out of their. They've got money coming out of their. You know what? So as far as affordability of tests or accessibility to a certain amount of tests, I don't buy that, you know, as an excuse. Right. But although, you know, there are some owners in some of those leagues that are frugal as far as dealing with players and other situations too, so who knows. Yeah. But hopefully we can get, hopefully the Reds and baseball can get back on track. Uh, I know it's, it seems like it's getting tougher and tougher. It's kind of like I was even worried about this, not just with Major League Baseball, but with the KBO, with their shorter and scheduled. I'm, I was worried about with these rainouts. I mean, there would, and we'll talk more about the KBO later, but I mean, as you know, most of those teams, they're geographically close. I think the farthest point, I think Daniel Kim said, was from Seoul to like the southernmost team in South Korea is like a five and a half hour drive. So you're talking only about roughly like 330 miles so you know as far as weather patterns that's that's minimal so for them to right. get well that's that's why they were playing around with like the bubble type scenario if there was a flare up in a certain area mm -hmm. i don't understand why teams can't just move over to the other area right where even if the stadium itself isn't affected you move from that area where the general population is mm -hmm. and just go your merry way and keep the games going. Right. I think one sport that I think 
did the best with this as far as actually creating bubbles, even though NBA and the two North American soccer leagues seem to be doing all right within Florida. I think the NHL is doing the best, not necessarily because they moved out of the United States, but that they have two of them, where they have an Eastern Conference and a Western Conference. That's what I'm thinking baseball should do. They should have, since they're keeping, you know, all, basically all the Eastern teams, all the Central teams together anyway, just do like a, just two geographic bubbles and then have them meet. But that, that was the original intention, and then all of a sudden, uh, both Florida and Arizona and Texas, for that matter, flared up. Right. And and there's always concern about you know when those teams play home in those areas, and then they go to other stadiums. Eh, I don't know. It's I gotta stop saying I don't know, but in this case, I really don't know. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's really no answer to it. Um, I happen to think that the Marlins themselves are lucky, which this whole thing between the Marlins and the Rays being in the state right now with basically the second most total cases, they're playing with house money right now because you're seeing the numbers go crazy. Same in California. It's been a little bit of a drop off in Texas, but not so much. And in Arizona too. So if you went to a bubble type situation, you got to be careful where you put them. Mm. Well, there's it's funny you bring up Arizona because I was going to mention this a little later, but. Let's talk about this right now. There's a story regarding the World Baseball Classic, which originally was supposed to begin resume during spring training of 2021, part of the qualifiers in Arizona. This is an article according to Sportico.com. According to Sportico.com, the World Baseball Classic has been moved by the MLB and the Players Union to 2023 with a 20-team field. MLB had decided to move the World Baseball Classic from next season to 2023. A high place source told Sportico Monday. The announcement will officially come sometime after this COVID-abbreviated 60-game season and postseason. Um, the only international tournament that includes Major League players played every four years since 2009 was originally slated for next March 9th through the 23rd during spring training. Quote, with everything that's going on, this is where it is. Unquote, according to the source. All the details have not been nailed down yet. The tournament qualifiers were about to start in Tucson, Arizona when baseball was halted on March 12th because of the coronavirus. The 12 teams that had assembled in two brackets were sent scattering back around the world, including Team France, managed by veteran Bruce Bosey, who last year retired from the San Francisco Giants after 25 seasons as a big league skipper. Quote, I mean, I felt for those kids, end quote, Bosey said. They were excited about starting the tournament, the WBC. They worked hard. A lot of these guys are not doing it for a living. They have jobs back in France or wherever they live. To get that close and have it postponed, some of them kind of got emotional. They broke down. It was tough. End quote. A new set of qualifiers will now be staged in 2022. Originally, the main tournament next year was slated to be played in Japan, Taiwan, Phoenix, and Miami, with three rounds to be held at Marlins Park, including the semifinals and championship game. Those are still the probable sites in 2023. The field was set to expand to 20 teams for the first time, with the 16 teams that competed in 2017 already seeded, which are Australia, Canada, China, Chinese Taipei, Colombia, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Israel, Italy, Japan, the Netherlands, Korea, Mexico, Puerto Rico, United States, and Venezuela. Whether the same format will be used in the qualifiers is still to be determined. The qualifiers were played in different parts of the world rather than one place in 2016. Everything's on the table, according to the source. We will look at the ty all types of opportunities, including going back out into the regions. 
The WBC tournament is a joint partnership between Major League Baseball and the MLB Players Association. It had its inaugural run in 2006 and is heading towards its fifth edition. Japan won the first two titles, followed by the Dominican Republic and then the United States, which defeated Puerto Rico 8-0 at Dodger Stadium in 2017. Team Israel's performance going deep into the second round before elimination was another highlight of the tournament. It was the greatest success up to that point for Israel baseball on the world stage. The final game in 2009 also at Dodger Stadium with Japanese icon Ichiro Suzuki singled home the winning run in the top of the 10th inning to defeat Korea is considered one of the greatest international games of all time. International stars such as Yu Darvish and Daisuke Matsusaka of Japan and Aroldis Chapman and Yana Cespedes of Cuba made their impact print on the WBC long before they played the MLB. In the year's postponed qualifiers, Hall of Fame shortstop Barry Larkin was back managing Team Brazil. Whether he or Bochy will be there in two years is a real question, as is how many of the same players will return to represent their respective teams. Quote, like I've said before, I never say never about anything, said Bochy, who at 65 had survived five heart procedures. Quote, I don't know how you can do that, end quote. So, tying into Arizona and MLB and the MLB Players Association and international baseball, which is definitely what you and I are all about, Eric. Eric puts him back to the World Baseball Classic to 2023. It's probably a smart move, especially where they were talking about the sites for the championship matches, I guess. Mm. Well, I'm just hoping that all the venues stay the same, even for the qualifiers, because the way that they were discussing it back when it was first scheduled, the qualifying round, which was basically 12 teams in uh, two divisions of six, were all in the system area, so it was not intruding with spring training in any way. Hmm. I don't remember all the coaching staffs, but the one that stood out, obviously, was Bochy. I actually have somewhat of a contact with the Pakistan people as far as their qualifications. I gotta tell you, they don't know the game as well as a lot of countries might do. I mean, they were basically trying to beg for their equipment mm. from different manufacturers or whatever, or sponsorships. I got friendly with a lot of people, including their management, who are very, very nice guys. Uh, they've probably improved over the years. Their management has gotten them into a lot of international tournaments where they're getting better. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they'll excel, but at least they're making their mark in the world as far as improving themselves somewhat. So I don't even know who would be the favorite Amongst those teams, I would actually be pulling for Boch mm -hmm. since we have a little bit of that in common, which I could get into at some later date. But to have him manage and his son actually pitch, which was part of the reason why he was chosen as manager, I'd probably be favoring him and maybe the Brazilian team as well. Interesting. Yeah, because even like with a lot of the teams, I mean, it's it's a four-year gap. I mean, it's like the Soccer World Cup. It's like you're not going to get everybody back playing or everybody back coaching, that kind of thing. And then you have the additional concerns with the COVID when it sounded like Bochy was at risk because of his age and health history, too. So, I mean, I don't know. I, don't know. I think with a lot of these sports, I think that's been a concern with the, the coaches and the staff members because of those risks, I guess. You're probably right on that one. With Bosch, he's had a lot of health issues, so when it did happen to exert itself in Arizona, I was probably at greatest concern of him. Mm -hmm. But it's like we're saying now, because it's so uncontrolled, it is what it is. Right. Well... I, you know, I'm hoping that things will be cleared by then. I mean, it's a couple years away, but I don't know. As we keep going through this, it's 
team seems like, okay, well, six months from now, let's see what happens. And six months have arrived, and it's like, okay, we're still on, you know, we're still at phase one right. or phase two and all this other stuff. So. You got to take things as they come. That's, right. all, that's all we can ever hope for. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what kills me is, okay, they're saying, well, you know, we should have a vaccine for this at a certain amount of time. But there are certain diseases that we still don't have vaccines for today. We don't have it for the common cold. We don't have it for several types of cancer and other stuff. It's like, what makes you think they're going to get this taken care of right away? I, I don't know. It's and even, and even with vaccines, you've got a lot of people that are so skeptical about vaccines in general mm-hmm. that even if it was offered once it's fully deployable, they won't do it anyway. Right. Right. It's, yeah, I mean, and there's so many reasons for that, too. A lot of it on the liabilities as well. So, he, there's so much involved well, outside. There's malpractice of, insurance. Oh, yeah, definitely. You got a phone, you got a lawyer, that's for sure. <laughs> wow. All right, well, going on to other news in Major League Baseball. Some, yet another Said that's not so positive, but some of it I on I think it's kind of comical the way things are going off with this. The so, Oakland A's and the Houston Astros had a little bit of a dust up last week, and it's and I mean that whole situation uh, that it was comical. I, I mean it reminded me of like old school wrestling. Let me read this article real quick, and you and I can both comment about it. According to the USA Today, in their for the win column of their website, the Astros and the A's had a bench-clearing brawl despite Major League Baseball's stern warning. Heading into the restarted 2020 baseball season, MLB made it clear in its healthy and safety guidelines that fighting would not be tolerated. After all, the season was going to be played outside of a bubble setting with teams both traveling and not facing restrictions on the road, which is already proving, proving problematic. The last thing the MLB wanted to see was two teams come into an extremely close contact and start fighting. Well, MLB will have a chance to show the baseball world how serious it was about that warning. During the seventh inning of the Athletics game against the Astros on Sunday, Ramon Lariano was furious about being hit with a pitch for the second time in the game. He exchanged words with the Astros as he made his way up to first base, but chatter from the Astros dug out set Lariano off. And we could see as Astros hitting coach Alex Cintron challenged Lariano to a fight, calling him over, and Lariano charged after Cintron after that. MLB has come under fire this season for protecting the Astros amid their cheating scandal. Dodgers pitcher Joe Kelly was hit with an eight-game suspension earlier in the year for throwing at and mocking Astros players. But Cintron and Lariano both deserve harsh punishment here. These brawls simply can't happen with MLB's current season set up during an ongoing pandemic. Okay, and that was according to the columnist. Let's see, where was it? Oh, Andrew Joseph of the USA Today. A um, couple things about this. That the pitching coach for Houston, I mean, the reason I find that comical, remind, I mentioned last week I was a fan of professional wrestling. This reminds me of like old school southern NWA Memphis wrestling where you have like a coward manager of a bad guy taunting a good guy and then hiding behind his wrestlers. That's what this coach reminded me of. He was taunting Lariano, and then it's like he hid behind all his other players and all his other coaches instead of fighting. I mean, I don't know. I, you you probably remember this game years ago, too, Eric, since you're a Yankees fan. I'm an Orioles fan. I remember there was a bench-clearing brawl where I forget the Orioles pitcher, but I, I remember somehow Daryl Strawberry was a coach. I don't know if he was still a player then or he might have been an assistant coach. He, somehow he got in. Well, he got, you know, he got caught with a punch, actually. But, I mean, it's, you don't want this during COVID. You really don't want this any time. But, I mean, I don't know. Even if there wasn't any COVID, I mean, there was concern about this with the Astros. And I think you and I spoke about this with, I think, with um, Joe Kelly a couple of weeks ago. Um, what, what's your take on this? Well, here's one thing that will never be put out in the media unless you kind of take somebody into a corner. Mariana originally was an Astro prospect mm. in the system back 
and I believe 17. So there is a little bit of history between Loriano and the Astros. Now, whether this has anything to do with some sort of the cheating scandal, which was everybody was outing Mike Mike Fires for, hmm. because Fires came out and said that the Astros cheated, yada yada yada. There could have been some bad blood between Loriano, Cintron, and some of the other personnel on the Astros. Nothing has actually ever come out with that, but I'm sure there's something internal that we'll never know about unless he could actually get, like, ownership. The problem is a lot of the ownership from back then was already terminated because of the cheating scandal, like Finch and the rest of them. Hmm. So this whole thing you'll never know, but a lot of it is probably bad blood from his Astro days. Very Still possible. uncalled for, but what are you going to do? Yeah. Still uncalled for, and I don't know, there's... Yeah, the Astros didn't make a lot of friends. I mean, you had... You could see there... I mean, with what you had just mentioned with Lariano, you could see possible heat between him and the Astros. You definitely saw it with the Dodgers a couple of weeks ago. And and probably... And it wouldn't have surprised me if they would have defeated the Nationals last year. Probably the Nationals probably would have I don't know, raised a stink about something with them, too. But... Mm. MLB, get your act together, man. Come on. <laughs> oh, come on. If there was no fights, there'd be nothing exciting. You'd just be playing the game and going home. Oh, yeah, yeah. God forbid we should just be able to talk about games and players. And, and ESPN can't even seem to do that. And we, you and I have both discussed that on here and off the air about that for sure. Uh, Never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. You're right. Well, there was one positive thing that Major League Baseball was doing. In fact, it was doing... Today, the day of our taping, Sunday, August 16th. Major League Baseball is celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. Uh, let's see, and I will get to this article. It's from, this is according to CBS.com. Major League Baseball celebrates 100th anniversary of Negro Leagues. And, it's, and the Negro Leagues had all-time greats such as Josh Gibson, Satchel Paige, and Oscar Charleston, let's see. Sunday Major League Baseball celebrated 100th anniversary of Negro Leagues. See, yes, seriously. You, I mean, you just said that three times before you started the article. <laughs> all, all around the league, at ballparks, on telecasts, and on social media, we will be seeing fitting tributes. The Negro Leagues hosted all-time great players like slugging catcher Josh Gibson, power speed combo Oscar Charleston, all around excellent player cool Papa Bell, Uber talented Buck Leonard, and so many more. It also helped players like Jackie Robinson, Satchel Paige, Ernie Banks, Hank Aaron, Monty Earp, and Larry Doby, and so many others get professional experience before joining the majors after Robinson broke the color barrier. Paige was actually there strutting his a stuff and big league swagger for two decades before joining Cleveland at 41. He was then effective in the majors through age 46. A nice illustration of how good many of the Negro League players were, though they were deprived of playing in the majors for so long simply for not being born, or for, excuse me, for, for being born non-white. The Negro League's Hall of Fame and Museum in Kansas City is an excellent visit and a wonderful tribute to the Negro League players. Here are some of the tributes around the Major Leagues on Sunday, and they're just showing copies of tweets like from Major League Baseball. The Phillies have... Some Negro League players in as cardboard cutouts in their stands. Um, they, they have some interviews with a few players. They have Monty Harrison from the Miami Gi Giants on the Marlins Twitter program. Let's see. And who else do we have? And it looks like the Marlins are actually wearing Miami Giants uniform and worms in today's game. The Nationals have did an interview with Sean Gibson. And it was, and of course they have a long history with a team that I think they shared with Pittsburgh called the Homestead Homestead Grays. Um, a lot of interesting stuff about this. I'm a fan of baseball history, and I've read a lot of books about the Negro Leagues myself. Um, 
tell me, um, tell me your experience, any experiences you've had, Eric, since I know you, you've traveled a lot for a lot of reasons for baseball. Um, have you been to the Negro Leagues or any museums or exhibits that they have had? No, and as a matter of fact, that's probably on my bucket list. Kansas City, I never even hit as far as for a Royals game, mm-hmm. but with all the with all the stuff that I've been hearing about guys like Buck O'Neill, Satchel Paige, all the wonderful players that were coming out of that era, and never really had a shot until Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, mm. but. Could you just imagine if any of those guys had a shot at the majors, what they could have done? I certainly can, because there's a few thing, experiences I've had with that. Um, I haven't been to the museum in Kansas City either. Uh, I did see an interview with the curator on a KBO broadcast last week, and he went into detail where they not only have a museum, but they also have like a like a baseball academy, and you know, the for like I guess it. African American players in Kansas City, and they have like multiple fields, kind of almost like um, Cal Ripken's complex in Aberdeen. But um, they, yeah. One thing I had, had seen though, I saw an exhibit from that museum in Baltimore when they hosted the All Star Game in '93. They had a week long festival called the All Star Fan Fest. And I think they do this in every city that hosts a game. You probably went to some in New York for the Yankees and the Mets. They had a specific wing for the Negro League. Museum, and one of the exhibits was a team bus for the Kansas City Monarchs, which was basically a beat-up school bus. I mean, as obvious, I mean, it was an old bus. I guess it was like in the 40s or whatever. And obviously, there was no air conditioning. I don't even think it had seat belts. And I've even read in cases where, with some of the Baltimore teams, like the Baltimore Black Sox and the Elite Giants, where a lot of teams, because of segregation, they couldn't even check into a hotel. They literally had to sleep in these buses at you know between ball games, um, and just seeing that bus and thinking that that's that is just really foul. One thing I would like to invite you to, if you ever next time you come to our area and COVID regulations are lifted, Eric, there is actually a brewery here in Baltimore called I think it's called Waverly Brewery, but the structure of the brewery itself, where the brewery and the tap room is. It actually used to be part of a minor league and Negro League stadium in Baltimore. And that was the only part that was not destroyed in a fire because literally, I think, it was on the 4th of July of 1944, it was burnt down. But they had what was then the International League Orioles play and also the Baltimore Elite Giants play. And they have, I mean, they in their tap room, they have like a museum with a lot of different pictures and everything. Um, I'll send you a link to the website off the air and I'll post on YouTube in the description to that place. It's it's some place I've never had a chance to go myself even though I live in the area, but I wanted to go to that. I think you would you know I would both get some enjoyment out of it. Even you know, even if you don't partake in alcoholic beverages, I think that would be interesting for any baseball you know, fan of any age to see. I think, you know, just a lot of things to attend. That that's actually that's actually pretty cool. I, I didn't even know that existed. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the only other thing that I've been to of that magnitude, and it's not necessarily in this country, but uh, I was actually at the Dominican Hall of Fame mm. uh, when we were on a cruise ship, and I believe it was the, the stadium where the Toros are. They took us on a stadium tour, and... Within the skyboxes of the stadium, they had a whole bunch of Hall of Fame items within the ballpark. Oh, wow. Uh, It's just a nice way to commemorate some history uh, with jerseys and or whatever. It just just brings a new perspective into the game. Right. That's interesting. I, I mean... Now, did you know about that when you went on that cruise, or that was just something you had discovered? Or No, absolutely not. Um, as a matter of fact, the cruise before, where it was the same type of city tour that had passed by the stadium, we, we had just passed by it hmm. and not actually gone into it. Okay. But for so 
some crazy reason, whoever organized the tour off of the ship, I thought it was going to be the same type of thing where we were just going to pass by it. No, we actually stopped, got off the bus, and they did a whole stadium tour for us. Mm. So that was that was awesome. Mm. Yeah, definitely in your wheel, I'm sure. <laughs> I actually just wish there could have been some players floating around that I would have known haphazardly and I would have scared the living crap out of both of them. <laughs> 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 mm. As it is, though, I did take a picture with the mascot. And okay, there you go. That was... Got a kick out of it. Mm. Yeah, you, you know how to circulate, circulate your way around various baseball fields around the world. God bless you, man. Awesome. <laughs> so, all right. Okay, and with that, we will go now go to the Major League standings. I'm not going to go through the out-of-town scores because many of the games are going on right now, and I'm not sure how many of you folks really care about week-old game day scores, so I'm just going to go right to the standings right now for the, the Major Leagues. We'll start in the AL East. Where the Yankees are in first place with 14-6. Surprisingly, and I don't know how long this is going to last or how close they're going to be to this at the end of this season, but the Baltimore Orioles are 12-8. and eight. Followed by the Tampa Bay Rays at 13-9. and nine, The Blue Jays at 7-10. and 10, And the Boston Red Sox at 6-15. and 15. I had heard this was going to be a down year for them, but I had no idea. I, yeah, it's, they're having some problems there. But oddly enough... Among those problems are not Corona, and we haven't heard any positive tests with that team so far. Knock on wood. With any, you know. Then we go to the AL Central. We have the Twins leading at 13-8. and eight. The Indians just half a game, 12-9. Detroit at 9-9. Nine and nine. The White Sox at 10-11. and 11. Kansas City Royals at 9-12. and 12. So that division looks like it's still kind of close. The AL West, we have the Oakland A's. After their cage match with the Houston Astros, 15 and 6. Texas Rangers at 10 and 9. Those same Houston Astros at 10 and 10. The Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim and anywhere else they want to come from, 7 and 14. And at the bottom, we have the Seattle Mariners at 7 and 15. Going to the National League, we have the Corona Fish and the Miami Marlins at 9 and 5. The Atlanta Braves at 12 and 10, the Phillies at 7 and 9, the Mets at 9 and 13, and the defending World Series champion Washington Nationals at 7 and 11. In the NL Central, the Cubs are leading 13 and 5. <laughs> the Cardinals playing a whopping total of seven games and are in second place at 4 and 3. Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, and we have the Brewers at 9 and 10, the Reds at 9 and 11. And the Pittsburgh Pirates at 4-14. Four Going to the NL West. At the Dodgers at 15-7. Colorado Rockies at 12-8. The San Diego Padres might be a surprise. 11-11. The Arizona Diamondbacks at 10-11. And, and the San Francisco Giants at 8-14. And, and those are your standings for Major League Baseball. Uh, your thoughts on any of those? or? I gotta tell you, I'll, I'll give a little credit to Baltimore. They are doing surprisingly well. Uh, I, it's, I don't even know where this comes from. Whether it's just a bunch of guys that are having fun with, in their minds, nothing to play for. Right. That are just going out there and going through the motions and just playing with house break. Or if it's the fact that you've got teams that they're playing against that either, for lack of a better word, suck <laughs> or are rebuilding. Right. In the case of Toronto and Boston. Right. Where given the schedule the way that it is, you're playing game, you're playing ten games against your division opponents. So that's twenty games right there where if you're somewhat legitimate, if you're not going at least 15 and 5 against those two teams, there's something wrong. Right. And I think the Orioles, though, they, I think 
out of those two teams, I think they played Boston in the home series. I don't think they they played the Blue Jays yet. So it's but I mean, and it seems like it seems like they played more national team, league teams lately. And it's like they had like a they played in DC last weekend, and that rain tarp game that was suspended. They had a replay in Baltimore on Friday with the Orioles wearing their road uniforms for like two and a half innings and then having their regularly scheduled game. God, the scheduling is just, you know, this is crazy. It's, it, it's actually kind of fun to watch in a way as long as nobody gets hurt, but this is nuts. But, yeah, they played them a bunch of times and then they had the Marlins, which basically kind of reminded me of the movie Slapshot where the team at the championship game just got a whole new roster just so of goons to fight the Paul Newman's Charles Town Chiefs. It seems like what the Marlins almost did against the Orioles. Not to say that the Marlins players are goons, but they had to basically patch up a whole new lineup. Almost almost kind of like the Indians lineup in the first two Major League movies, I guess. I don't know, but... Uh, some crazy stuff. It's, it's all patchwork, but I, I gotta give them credit for at least, you know, trying to assemble somewhat of a team Given the cir- given the circumstances that they have with the alternate site, as I love to call that, <laughs> you're getting guys that are basically single A players that are pretty much living the dream. That next year in a full 162 situation would be back at a double A level. That's a good point. I actually think it's kind of fun. That's a good point, because you don't have any major leagues. You just have, like, the taxi squads. You'd have pretty much, I guess, it's almost like a, almost like instructional ball, where, I mean, they're not even playing opponents. It's just all, like, inter-squad matchups, I guess, what they have to do until they get a call-up from the major league team right now. And then, of course, right. it's, with the Blue Jays, I don't know, all I think of is the line in the Three Stooges were shuffling up the Buffalo. I mean, those poor guys got to play in their AAA park, which... No, you know, nothing against Buffalo. Good for them that they get to host games and all. And if I was in Buffalo, I'd kind of be almost mad that, you know, I don't get to see any Major League Baseball and they're in my home stadium. But then, but the reason they can't is because they can't see their AAA. I think they're the, are they still the Buffalo Bisons or? Yeah. Yeah. They can't see any of their games this year. So <sighs> baseball's giving us definitely a lot to talk about. So. Absolutely. All right. All right, folks. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to move our tour over to Korea to talk about our friends in the KBL. You're listening to ba- Pro Baseball World Talk right here on RTC Media Multimedia. Alright folks, welcome back to Pro Baseball World Tour here on the RGC Multimedia YouTube channel. Rick Crab, Eric Marinback. And as I mentioned, we are moving our tour over to South Korea with the KBO. Um, no news that I saw as far as the actual playing of the KBO other than we still have that excellent pennant race. Um, I'll say this with a little bit of a bias because this is my personal favorite team in that league, but the LG Twins, it seemed like their bats have came alive against the Dinos. Um, the Dinos, I think, are being exposed, not just by the Twins, but throughout the league as far as their bullpen play and their overall, even their starting pitchers getting lit up lately. Um, and Kiwoom seems like they're still st- holding strong. The Wiz and the Lante Giants are holding strong, and the Tiger, Kia Tigers are still in the mix, too. So you still have a nice little, you know, Kind of a rugby scrum with all those teams fighting for like third, fourth, and fifth place. I mean, they're all you got like four or five teams just for those positions that are still in it. Uh, once again, I mean, we talked about this last week, Eric. I mean, KBO is definitely providing some fun baseball, and folks who want to just dismiss it that MLB is back, especially you, ESPN analysts, you are missing out. The one thing that I like about the Dinos. They made a very interesting four-player deal earlier in the week with the Kia Tigers acquiring their closer. Mm. And I had 
I have said this for many, many weeks. As good as the starting pitching is, once you get past their starting pitching, their bullpen is absolutely horrendous. They will blow leads left and right. So any addition that you can get to that bullpen, whether it's a closer, mid reliever, or somewhat, it's going to help them tremendously. I actually got to meet the closer that they got from Kia during the Fort Myers spring training, and he did it. So if that helps any... Yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah, they need, and you know, and especially this weekend's LG. I mean, you had them go against like Hansu Kim, Ramos, yet Park. I mean, the, I mean, that's that's like a murderer's row for their lineup, Eric. And I mean, you, you, if your bullpen's gonna fail, I mean, you're gonna fail miserably. And it's like, I mean, there were a couple games this weekend that I didn't get a chance to see this morning's game, but I know I saw Friday and Saturday is just. LG was going to double digits with them. It was, it was it was something to see. I mean, it looked almost more like a fourth quarter, like a first or second quarter football score than baseball. But it that was crazy. And even though even though it is the KBO, and you can kind of like be optimistic that well, hopefully the other teams bullpen will suck too. That wasn't the case with this game. It was, they were just out of reach early and. I think it was a good move for the Dinos to get a closer. One thing I want to comment, I did hear Daniel Kim say earlier last week on an ESPN broadcast, and he made a good point. With our with the KBO, you have not only one league, you really have like one division. It's not like Major League Baseball where you have two leagues and then, you know, like three divisions in each league, or even Japan where you have the Pacific and the Central, they have like one division. And Daniel Kim pointed out it's like teams are very cautious with trading with each other because they view every team as a division rival. And really they are, if you think about it. That's why I was actually surprised that uh, Kim was willing to trade with them. I I guess in that particular league... There's no such thing as buyers and sellers like we have in the major leagues where you've got teams that want to develop for the future and you know, just pick up random guys from their minor league system because, let's face it, even with these future leagues, there's not the prospects, per se, that you'd have in, like, there's, say, a minor league system of the major leagues. Right. In America. That's Even the Futures League broadcasts, they're not really publicized. There's uh, not too much coverage on it. So, with the 10 team league the way it is, you've got to be very sure that it's an even trade and not so much lopsided as a selling standpoint. That's a good point, and it's, it's like a lot of their international scouting, like with MLB here, I mean, we have, teams will have scouts for Dominican Republic and Japan and Mexico and other parts of the country, where the KBO, I mean, they're limited to how many foreign players they have, and really, they're only allowed to have two pitchers and one position player, so, I mean, we're used to, in this country, getting a prospect from, like, the Dominican Republic and running in through our minor league system and sending and sending them up to the bigs. Korea, you really can't do that. And also another thing with the foreign players, a lot of them are players that played usually in this country that are frustrated that you don't want to be in double A AA or triple A for X amount of years. They want to get some some type of professional salary and they want to be scouted and possibly looked at and to go to a major league squad. So a lot I mean It might have changed because of this particular season, but a lot of players that came to the KBO basically came here just to kind of like pad their resume a little bit. And it's funny because a lot of times they used to say when a player would jump over from the major leagues over to Asia, 
that their careers were washed up. Yeah. And and players, you know, would like basically look to survive rather than resurrect the career to make it back to America. Right. A lot of this, a lot of this has changed now. I I, where, I agree. And there are a lot of these players are coming over mm-hmm. to America and not necessarily excelling, but at least getting the exposure to the point where somebody's interested. Oh yeah, no doubt. Unfor- unfortunately, the results haven't been as good for the most part with a lot of these guys. Mm-hmm. But at least the fact that the scouting is proven to enhance interest, that's what's getting more exposure for the leagues. Right. And there, I've even heard like some local and national talk show radio hosts, they're still skeptical about that. It's like, there was a guy here local, he was talking about some, when the KBO first began, about some of the players he used to play in Baltimore, like a couple of pitchers, like Mike Wright and Tyler Wilson. He was like, looking at their numbers, it's like, God, that league must really suck. If they're posting good numbers there, because they were, they were dog crap here, you know? It's like, and that, that's ignorant, you know? I mean, it's, that's a professional league too. It's not like they're playing, you know, like, uh, a fast pitch softball league or something, you know. It's, I don't know. I mean, granted, okay, there are some hitters that are, I mean, that may be like double A AA or triple A if they came here, but there are some, I mean, that can rake, that can field, that are every bit as good. They can play some teams over here. And I, and I, I've watched a few games, I'm thinking, man, I wish the Warriors could get this guy, or I'd like to see him play for. So and so, or even like you know, there are some left field, left handed hitters I like to see play for your Yankees because you know they usually excel in Yankee Stadium traditionally. So I don't know. It's I I just want to see baseball, and I like the I feel like the playing field is leveling out for these international leagues, and the fact with technology where you can see them on ESPN, we you can see them on Twitch, and the various VPNs you and I have spoken about, and now, and there will be other broadcasts which we'll be talking about later in this broadcast that we'll be discussing too for other countries. But anyway, I don't know. I, I love one as usual. I love one seeing from KBO, and I'm sure you and a lot of our listeners do too. The the only other thing I want to bring up is remember we were discussing. Uh, a while back about a series of rainouts. Right. It hasn't been as bad. Uh, it's, it's worse, actually, in Korea than it has been in Taiwan mm-hmm. with the rainouts and the makeups. They're trying to attempt to copy what the major leagues are doing as far as shortening the games. Right. To seven inning double headers. Which I don't mind. I mean, it keeps players fresher longer. I think, yeah, I think it's interesting with that league too, because they have the Mondays off, and I know they've had some days where they try to make up those games. But I'm kind of surprised in a way they don't use them more often for that. Maybe they will when they come closer to the end of the season. But yeah, I found that interesting I- as well. But. I'm actually very surprised that they haven't gone to the seven-day schedule. Now, maybe it's because of what players are used to, especially pitchers, with the extended uh, off day. Right. Where it's more of a six-man rotation instead of a five-man, or, you know, it could go to a four-man rotation, which could take away uh, from playing time for a fifth starter, which... For the most part, the fifth starter is the guy that will give up, you know, seven or eight runs a game and get pulled because the bullpen is basically worn out. Right. So. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that too for uh, protecting the pitchers. I, I mean, there's definitely a case where pitchers can get worn out, and I've even some seen some games, Eric, where it's like a starter will will be getting clobbered, but they'll keep him in there just, I guess, to keep the bullpen arms a little fresher, just because. As we joke, as I, we joked a lot on this show, you know, the, there's no lead that's safe in the KBO. So, um, but 
John, and it's kind of it's kind of like the joke, you know, where in spring training, a guy's getting knocked around, but he quote unquote has to get his work in. Mm, right. So he has to be at this at a specific pitch count. Yeah, I mean, it you sounds know, like little league, league is like okay, we got to get everybody playing. I don't know. It, it, for professional leagues, it's, as a fan, you don't want to see that, but as someone where that's their job, I guess you can understand that. But right, hmm. couple of, one article I'm going to mention. I saw two articles related to this, but I'm only going to read one. Um, basically, there are COVID concerns I've seen with the. With our friends in Korea, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. We can find which article I want to talk to about this. Okay. All right. We'll go to this one here because it affects four teams in the league. Um, basically saying, it says, sport teams in Seoul surrounding region revert to crowdless games. This is according to the Yonhap News Agency from Korea themselves. Um, he said, Less than a month after welcoming fans back to stadiums, South Korea professional sports teams in Seoul and its surrounding region will revert to having empty stands due to a recent spike in coronavirus cases. This was as of Korea time yesterday, August 15th. The government on Saturday raised the three-tier social distancing scheme in Seoul and, and I apologize for our Korean, to our Korean fans if I mispronounce it, Jianji province from level one to level two, effective Sunday. It will stay there for two weeks. With that, all indoor gatherings of 50 or more people and outdoor gatherings of 100 or more people will be banned, which means no crowds at sports games. Cluster infections in and around Seoul have emerged as a major concern in recent days. South Korea reported 166 new COVID-19 cases Saturday, a second straight day with the figure surpassing the century mark. It's the highest daily total since March 11th. Among those 166, 155 were locally transmitted cases, and 72 of those 155 were reported in Seoul, plus another 67 from the surrounding Jianji province. South Korea introduced a three-level social distancing drive, and the country had been at level one. The level can be altered locally as necessary. Teams in the KBO reopened their gates to fans on July 26th, followed by K-League football clubs on August 1st. In early stages, teams were only allowed to operate stadiums at 10% of their capacity to ensure the safety and health of fans. Under protocols for both leagues, fans must sit at least a seat apart from one another, even if they're traveling in a group. Then starting this week, the government raised the cap to 30%. KBO and K-League teams said they would stay around 25% to continue to ensure fan safety while adhering to COVID-19 guidelines. And now, at least for teams in and around the capital city, it will be back to square one. In the KBO, four teams play in Seoul and Jianji, the Doosan Bears, the LG Twins, and the Kiwoom Heroes in the capital, and the KT Wiz and Suwon, 45 kilometers south of Seoul. In the top flight K1, K-League 1, three clubs are based in the capital area, FC Seoul in Seoul, Seongnam FC in Seongnam, to the south of the capital, and Suwon Samsung Blue Wings in Suwon. The K-League 2 has a team each in Seoul and Suwon, plus three more clubs in Jianji Province, in Busan, Ansan, and Anyang. So, so pretty much it's like KBO or, and South Korea are, are keeping track of the COVID. Even though they're being cautious, you still haven't heard any positive cases with the players, which I'm glad to see, and it was fun to watch fans in the stands, but you want to, you definitely want to protect the fans and you know, and the players and their safety. And South Korea, we've been saying it many times, Eric. They seem like they're doing it the right way. And to add to that, there was another article. I'm not going to read that article, but the KT Wiz basically ended their, you know, they went back to an empty stadium for their games altogether. I think they. May have been a team that was doing that already, anyhow, just because of local jurisdictions. But our friends in South Korea, you know, please be careful with it too. It seems like you're being much more careful than you know, than the folks in our country. But you know, hang in. You're doing the right thing. That's that's what I like about how Asia more or less took care of the virus first, uh, which I wish. Could have, would have, should have happened here in the U.S. I mean, they had 
a certain amount of cases. They mitigated it. They did what they had to do. We had a very slow response. We had uh, naysayers. We had lack of testing. We had a lot of people that we should have trusted that we didn't to give us information about the pandemic. Where, in hindsight, if we would have listened to the people that we should have, we probably could have combated this back in April when, quote unquote, it was supposed to be gone. Right. You know, I, I know I love to fall back on this political line, but, and I'm not even going to dive into that one. Yeah. But it could have, would have, should have had we listened to the right people and it was chosen not to for whatever reason, whether political or otherwise. Yeah, it's it's a lot of controversy and a lot of nonsense with that, and it's COVID, COVID, COVID. What are you going to say? There's one thing I wanted to ask you about the KBO, Eric, your opinion. This is something positive about it, though, where I've noticed with the fans in KBO. Now, I mentioned to you last week, I noticed a lot of female fans with the jerseys, but one thing baseball in this country seemed to suffer from is getting a younger audience an 18 to 49 demographic I guess um seems like a lot of these games of and maybe it's just the cameraman's just selective they just want to see cute Asian girls with the little kitty cat ears in their jerseys but it seems like it's a much younger audience at these games you know with these fans um have you observed that with Watson KBO or or with the other Asian leagues such as in Taiwan and Japan I actually do observe it, and it, it's the same way all over. As the weather gets warmer and people want to get out, I hate to say this in maybe a chauvinistic or a perverted manner, but the less you wear, the more the cameras are going to be on you. Hmm. I don't know whether they do it deliberately, right? but... It, it kind of brings out the beast in people. Yeah, true, true. I mean, I've seen some look like young male fans, too. I mean, look like, you know, guys in their guys and gals in their 20s and their 30s, that kind of thing. And, and there is a lot of what you had mentioned as well. And I think that's true with a lot of sports. I know when my father and I used to have Baltimore Ravens season tickets, it seemed like the only games you would see women attend, and this is not to be chauvinistic, no, this is just an observation, or maybe it was just in our section we had a bunch of older Caucasian fellas. Um, it seemed like that's, those would be the only games you would see the women. And you would see them, you, they would get their customized jerseys that would be bejeweled and blinged and everything out. And then then you go to, like, you know, a October game against the Cleveland Browns, and you wouldn't see any of them. I mean, it's, it's I don't know. Maybe, maybe, there is something, maybe, maybe that has something to do with it as well, you know. In in a different context, fair weather fans, I guess you could call it. You can dress provocatively when it's cold. Well, you you can, but it might create problems for you. I, I actually, I actually, this person wasn't pr dressed provocatively, but I went to a game in Pittsburgh years ago at Three Rivers. It, they played against. Give you an idea how old this was, Eric. They played against the New England Patriots when Drew Bledsoe was their quarterback. Anyway, I saw, like, in the third quarter, they had this guy who was about 300 pounds, and it was bitter cold. It was cold, it was windy, wind, water was coming off of the three rivers and swirling around in that stadium. And it was this guy, he looked like Dan Deardorff in wearing just, like, red boxer shorts, jump, dancing on the top of, like, his entrance to go back into the concourse for, you know, to, like, the intermission music. And I think even when the music stopped and football came back on, he was still dancing to whatever was playing in his head and, you know, and his eighth cup of Iron City, I don't know, but, it, yeah. It, you, you see some sights at some of these sporting events, that's for sure. <laughs> well, he also don't know his blood alcohol level at the time. I mean, the gentleman was fairly large. He could, he could have had a high tolerance, but I think he was still past the tolerance nonetheless. I, you know, I, I hope someone else was driving him back from the game, but... <laughs> or carting them back. 
<laughs> yeah, really. I mean, I don't know. It's, I don't want to be. I don't want to be too negative to Pittsburgh. I'm sure we have some listeners from there. I mean, I'm a Baltimore Ravens fan, and I know we've, I've had some not so positive interactions with Pittsburgh Steelers or Pirates fans in the '79 World Series, for that matter, or Penguins fans with the Capitals. But no, we're all friends on here, so I'm not going to go that route. But. Pittsburgh likes to party before their sporting events, and they probably do it as well as anybody throughout the country and maybe throughout the world. So, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Okay, moving on and trying to be trying to be a slightly more professional, I'm going to go to the standings of the KBO right now. And as we mentioned, the NC Dinos, they were still at the top of the standings at 48 and 30. The Keelum Heroes, because of win one loss percentage, actually have four more wins than the Dinos, but they're in second place with 52 and 35. The LG Twins, who were part of the reason the Dinos slide, are 48, 36, and 1, and in third place right now. Good job, Twins, all right. The Bears are not, Tucson Bears are not far behind them at 46, 36, and 2. The Kia Tigers are 40. 37-0 in 5th place. And then fighting for the the for the top 5 spots, we have the, the Wiz that are not far behind at 42-38. and 38. The Lote Giants at 40-38-1. They, and I spoke about them a little bit, Eric. They seemed like they, they really impressed me against Doosan last week in their series. The Samsung Lions are 40-43-1. The Wyverns, four guys, 27, 56, and 1. And the Fighting Hanwha Eagles at 22, 60, and 1. So those are your standings for the KBO. All right. Okay, do you have any more comments about the KBO before we switch our tour dates? Or? Well, I'm just hoping that actually they figure out the rainout situation. And uh, as the trading deadline approaches, that they can, uh, the teams that are up at the top can just solidify their positions and stay up there. All right. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, well, there's a concern and, you know, COVID looks like it's still a concern there, but like we both mentioned, you know, they, seems like they have a good handle on it, definitely within their players, um, the I even heard, remember, like, at the beginning of the season, it was like, with Seoul, they were closing down a few things after an outbreak. They still had the games going on, but they closed a few bars and restaurants, and then people were complaining that, well, they're opening water parks, why can't they open a baseball stadium? Well, now you see why, so. Well, that's, that's why we think our little KBO group, uh, there's a little bit of a controversy as far as, well, why can't they do that with churches also, but. Right. True that, yeah. There's, there's all there are a lot of different groups and assemblies, or like, why can't we do this? You know, you hear that also with like Ruth Rock concerts and stuff like that too. But hey, look, this is baseball. Get everybody home safe. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right. Get all right. The park. I'm sorry. Play the game. Get them in the park. Get them to play the game. Finish it. Get them home. That's, that's right. the name of the game, actually. Pretty much. I, 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 and personally, I feel that way with all professional sports right now. Right now, ESPN and Fox and anybody that broadcasts professional sports, as far as I'm concerned, you're the game show network right now. Just keep stand, fans out of the stands. You can put in the fake cheers or the cardboard cutouts or or like the EA Sports weird Twitter emojis like the NBA is doing or whatever. You know, whatever. Just... Just do what you can to keep the games going and keep the players safe if they want to play. And and I'll say at home, fine, you know, beer's cheaper, food's cheaper, seats are more comfortable. I can bring my cat to the games, you know. It's win, 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 win. <laughs> there you go. All right. All right, folks, coming, we're going to take another break. And coming back, we're going to defer to Eric's knowledge of the CPVL in Taiwan, talk about Going on with that league as well. You are listening to Pro Baseball World Tour here on the RGC Multimedia YouTube channel. All right, 
right, folks, welcome back to Pro Baseball World Tour here on the RGC Multimedia YouTube channel. Rick Crabb, Eric Marinbeck. And as I mentioned before the break, and as I mentioned every week on this show, Eric, I defer to your knowledge of the great people of Taiwan and the CPBL. What is going on in that league this week, sir? You had a lot of good games. Some close ones, some kind of runaway-ish. You did have a rainout thrown in here and there. I think there was one on Tuesday. There was one actually on, I think, Friday as well. The good part about it is their rainy season per day is, I'm not going to say over, but right. it subsided to the point where you can get them and get the games in and not have to have an overload in there for the following week. Mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of the season, rather, where you're having to extend the regular season to make up those games and or have double headers. Right. Mm. Well, and fortunately, we haven't had any bird attacks this week. Um, I heard there was also no, the, no. The, there were no animal attacks. Everything ran as normal. Uh, you had your basic fun mm -hmm. at a CPBL game. You had nice crowds. You had timely hitting. You had decent pitching. Well, well, good. Yeah. And the, the standings are reflecting that. As a matter of fact, the only reason why there's any sort of a change in the standings from last week to this week is due to a, due to a rainout. Right, yeah, you can see as far as, yeah, because it, I see, it looks like Fubon and the and Rocketon played 16 games and the Uni Lions and Shining Trust, the, the Brother Elephants, I apologize if I screwed that up, but yeah, it looks like they played 17, so yeah, that, it's what it looks like there, and those standings are very close as I'll look at them right now. We have Fubon leading in 9 and 7, Uni Lions at 9 and 8, the Rocketon Monkeys at 8 and 8, and the China Cross Brothers 7 and 10 in the second stage of the CPBL season. Oh. Now, Eric, I wanted, we go. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. I heard this story it was mentioned last week, but I had heard it like several months before that, though. Um, with We were joking about animal attacks and... When I first heard about that and read that there was an, actually a team called the Monkeys, I had heard that they were, I don't know if it's under control now, but I had heard in Taiwan for a while they were having problems with monkeys that had traditionally been fed by tourists and other people. And the fact that COVID kept people quarantined or locked down or whatever, monkeys would actually get aggressive and attack people, you know, for their food. You know, it's like they would be like, you know. And it would be, it would almost be like seagulls at a beach where you'd have several of them. It wouldn't be just one. And have you heard anything about that, at least with these games, or just in general? I don't know if people you've spoken to in Taiwan about this. Not really. And believe it or not, uh, monkey brains are actually somewhat of an Asian delicacy mm. where they they would actually do uh, somewhat similar to a Hawaiian pig roast. Oh, gosh. Where they would have a table with the center cut out. Mm -hmm. And more or less, and I've never experienced this, Billy, uh, more or less the monkey itself, you know, under the table, mm. dead, obviously, right. and head cut open. And these... Uh, Chinese uh, Chinese people would be actually eating the contents of the brain. Ooh, yeah. How that's actually possible, Lord only knows, and it kind of grosses me out as I'm actually talking about it. Right. But it's somewhat of a delicacy. I, yeah, the only experience, and this wasn't really an experience, I just seen this. I remember Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, so they did that, like, at a, they had like a big feast at the Taj Mahal, and that was one of the things. It was them and these giant scarab bugs, it looked like the size of blue crabs that we eat in Maryland, unfortunately, which kind of like, I don't know, didn't want me eating seafood for a while, but it was, that's the only, I had heard that too, and I had seen, you know, I remember seeing that scene in the movie itself, but, 
Yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually amazed that sometimes, you know, I will hear about something, but yet, I don't know, take a couple of days not even thinking about it and then go back to eating it. Right. <laughs> oh, I, I, I know that feeling too. It's like I remember one time I went to the Maryland State Fair and they had a, they had their different produce exhibits and they had one they showed what bacon looked like after they took it out of a pig and I was like oh man I, I've eaten this with my breakfast really and then I've done the same thing though like a week or two later I'm you know I'm, I'm throwing it on the grill with some eggs you know it's like not even thinking about it so it, it's funny how that works sometimes I guess I don't, it's human nature yeah definitely yeah we're just too carnivoristic for our own good I guess Eric I don't know <laughs> so alright um Okay, so do we we have any other news about that particular league, or? Well, the only the only thing that I did want to bring out was the monkeys did have a couple of milestones where they had, I believe, it was their childhood home run in franchise history. You had fifteen thousand runs in their history uh, during a milestone. I think it took place on Wednesday. So. So the league itself, I think it's flourishing. Mm. You're going to get uh, players that came from this year's draft that might actually be integrated into some of the games just to get some exposure. Right. But this second, this second half, I think, as of now, because you're not getting the distance between the four teams, but it's going to be a lot tighter than it was in the first half, I think. Right, and that, and you're seeing the fans in the stands too, and it's like, it seems like, I mean, the games are fun to watch, I mean, you have to, I mean, a lot of people, they too common compare KBO to MLB, or NPB to MLB, or CPBL to MLB, and really, you just have to enjoy it as just, okay, it's baseball, and then enjoy the nuances for what it is, because, I mean, it's not, I mean, the levels of play may be different, but also, even if levels of play were the same, you'd have, you have different strategies, you have different obstacles to contend with, I mean, I, I never heard of, a, I never heard of a bird delay, you know, until <laughs> talking to you last week, and, but, you know, it's, seriously, I mean, it, it's, one, I mean, we talk about how all the negatives with this pandemic. One positive thing is I'm getting exposure to sports in other countries, and it's really a lot of fun. I mean, a lot of people don't want to do it because of the time differences, that kind of thing, or they don't know how to access Twitch. I mean, I had a friend of mine, I was trying to explain to him about the delayed broadcast for KBO on Twitch, and he's like, well, how do you do that? I'm like, dude, it's like YouTube. You, you have five games to choose from. You have, like, 15 hours of baseball for free every day. I mean, what do you want? <laughs> it's like, but... I, I just I just love the fact, uh, and I guess it's because Taiwan has gone, you know, like the full Monty, so to speak, as far as unlimited fans and uh, the different areas, because you've got the actual full experience of your typical Taiwan game where there's the cheerleaders, there's the song chants, there's all kinds of different stuff going on within the game. And then there's the game itself. It just, it's, it's mind-blowing. It really is. Hmm. Whether it's a close game or a blowout, these fans don't leave. Right. They go out every day, whoever shows up. Mm -hmm. And there are your characters. I mean, within the within the Brother Elephants games, there's a bunch of, I don't know if they're teenagers or, you know, just whatever, but they seem to be regulars. And they really go all out when the elephants are up as far as their cheers, their dancing, their heckling, whatever, whatever, whatever. And that, that's all part of the fun of the game. Yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it sounds like similarities to KBO. But I think it seems like KBO, it seems like their fans are nicer to the sitting fans than, like, other sports leagues I've seen in other sports. I mean, it's like with the – I noticed with a lot of the international soccer and even in MLS, they, ha they have a lot of chants that are 
negative chance about the opposing team. Some of them, and it's like, I know DC United, they had one about the New York, now the team now called the New York Red Bulls. And it's like, I actually saw it was sung in Spanish and somebody from their fan clubs translated it for me. And it's like, not for over air radio, that's for darn sure. But, um, but I mean, yeah, I had heard that like with Premier League, it's like a lot of taunting and a lot of, you know, and. Oh, Premier League, as far as I knew, and this goes on with a lot of soccer teams within Europe, they can get feisty. Oh, very feisty. I mean, there have been riots, there have been fights. I mean, there, I mean, some of the Central and South American countries for years documented where if a call went against their team, they would go out and they would kill the ref. Or if their team was like in a World Cup qualifier and they wound up missing the World Cup because somebody like kicked the ball in their own goal or something, there would be fans after this player and killing them. I mean, it, it's just nuts. But, right. Well, you, you don't get that in the Asian leagues. No, no, you don't. With yeah, not unless you're the pitching coach for the Astros. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Oh, man. And it's ironic, though, because it's, at least that sport, you have a weapon that could potentially be used, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe soccer cleats, I guess, could be weapons as well. But, well, anyway, okay, once again, I'm going off the rails. I'm sorry, Eric. I'll bring us back to, bring us back to Earth. Um, We'll move on to our friends in Japan in the NPB. Um, One interesting story about that, and you and I were talking about this. There was a no-hitter thrown in the league this week. Let me get to that real quick. Or as quick. Uh, here we go. We had a player from the Sw- Swallows. Yasuhiro Ogawa fires Japan's Pro Bowl's 93rd no-hitter. Okay, and this is according to the Japan Times. Yokohama. The Tokyo Yakult Swallows right-hander Yasuhiro Ogawa threw the first no-hitter of the season on Saturday and the first of his career in a 9-0 Central League win over the Yokohama Dene Bay Stars. Ogawa's gem was the 93rd no-hitter in the history of Japanese pro baseball, and the 30-year-old became the 82nd player to accomplish the feat. Unlike in the major leagues, a no-hitter is not awarded by NPB unless a pitcher also throws a shutout. Wow, I didn't know that. Quote, last time I had a very frustrating outing, so I was keen to make up for that, end quote, said Ogawa, 5-2, and two, who surrendered four runs in five innings in a loss to the Bay Stars one week earlier. Quote, my catcher, Akahisa Nishida, called a confident game. My fastball was strong, and the fielders caught the balls behind me, so I was able to make a go of it, end quote. Quote, I first thought about it around the fifth inning. I know it's not an easy feat, so I just focused on each hitter and on maintaining my rhythm. And it's, it's probably good coaching there. It sounds like a good strategy. It worked. Ogawa struck out 10, no, notching the final one with his 129th pitch to end the game. He walked three batters. One reached on an error when a line drive spilled out of right fielder Taiki Hamada's glove in the second inning, while a second got on base while second baseman Taishi Haruka dropped a throw in the eighth inning. That error ruined a potential double play after Ogawa had walked the leadoff hitter, and while his pitch count climbing put his no hit bid in jeopardy, he retired the final six batters with relative ease. The Swallows opened the scoring in the third against Bay Stars ace Shota Imanaga at five and three on back to back one out RBI doubles by Tetsudo Yamada and Norichika Aoki. Imanaga allowed six runs, three earned over three and a half, in, excuse me, three and a third innings on six hits and three walks while striking out three. Bay Stars manager Alex Ramirez, who began his career in Japan with the Swallows, tipped his cap to Agawa afterward. Quote, he was on the whole night from the first inning right until the end, end quote, Ramirez said. Quote, they scored six runs by the fourth inning. He got better after that. So, congratulations to Mr. Ogawa for throwing the no-no. Um, I, Eric, I've had the pleasure of actually going to two no-hitters. Have you had a chance to go to since I know you've attended several baseball games? Oh, 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, Yankee-wise, I have actually had the pleasure of being at the last bunch of perfect games and or no-hitters. Uh, I was at the good no-hitter back in uh, whatever, I forget the year. I was at the well, the co-no-hitter in 98. I was nice. at the well, the Wells perfect game in 99. Oh, wow. Very nice. Every one of those games had different circumstances and different kind of little fun facts as to how I actually either think about going to the game and or what happened during it. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's been kind of fun. I've been to basically a series of minor league no-hitters, I was actually at the Johan Santana winner for the Mets. Oh, no kidding. Which, okay, I'm going to call it right now that if instant replay would have been instituted, there theoretically could not have been a uh, no hitter over a couple of fouls that should have, a couple of fair balls that were actually should have been called foul but weren't. Mm. But that's neither here nor there. It's still going in the record books as a Johan Santana no-no. I was there. I did miss actually a couple of no-hitters because I was away on vacation. I think I missed the Scherzer one, and I missed one that the Giants pitched against the Mets also. Okay. Yeah, I've been to two. One was in Baltimore at the Old Memorial Stadium. I forget the pitcher who won that, oddly enough, but it was against the Chicago White Sox and the White Sox that actually won that game. I remember the game being close at the seventh inning and Cal Ripken hitting a ground ball that... Oh, no, no, no. I take a... Let's see. Yeah, hitting a ground ball and it looked like, looked like it was a clean play. To me, it was, it was kind of through the first baseman off of the bag, but it was looked like it could have been judged as a base hit, but it was judged as a throwing error and... The fans cheered, and like from that point on, it was like the whole crowd turned on the Orioles and cheered for the White Sox to so just so they can see the no-no, which I don't know. I I didn't completely agree with, but it was kind of cool to see history there. Um, the other one I happened to see was in Philadelphia in the Phillies last year of the of Veterans Stadium. Me and a friend of mine, we at the last minute decided to go to a game up there. Um, if you've ever been to Veterans Stadium, that place was huge, and and, and there's well that that year especially, we had like about thirty thousand seats in the upper deck to choose from, and we just walked right up, bought two ten dollar tickets. We were thinking it was going to be a slugfest because it, the Phillies and the Giants, Giants had Barry Bonds, Phillies had Jim Tomey, so we thought they'd be like hitting balls all over the place. Come to find out. Kevin Millwood pitched for the Phillies. Oh, hitter, one to nothing and winning one to nothing. And I don't know. I I framed. I had a copy of the schedule that I got from the box office. I had the ticket. I even took pictures with a cheap Kodak disposable camera, and I even I don't know did a primitive Photoshop so we can see like the pitch and the reaction of the fans afterwards. And I, of course, I cropped out of. Phillies fan head head in his silhouette, you know, so I could see the game, but you know, see the picture. But yeah, those were the two I had the pleasure of going to, and I don't know it's cool to see history like that. Oh, absolutely! I mean, I could I could tell you a story on the on the cone perfect game where it was really weird that before the game, and this was back in the day where. A lot of us used to go to the player hotel uh, to hang out with guys, not only to get autographs, but because we were actually friends with uh, a lot of players and there was a lot of fraternizing. Mm. We had seen the Montreal Expos and I was talking to a bunch of the guys on the team that I knew and we all got our autographs or whatever we needed to do, and I'm just about to leave to go in my car. Next thing I know, the buses leave, but one player 
is actually he missed the bus. Oh. Guess who wound up driving him to Yankee Stadium that day? No kidding. It, it was myself. As a matter of fact, the guy, Guillermo Moda, who was a little bit of a hothead at the time, but he also, that day, happened to be a little brain dead. Oh, so he misses the bus, and he's freaking out, and I offered to drive him to the park, and, you know, he gets in my little, uh, I think I had a Camaro at the time, I'm not even sure. Okay. <laughs> but uh, he, gets, he gets in my car, and we drive in, I actually got into the player's lot, and so on and so forth. So, the perfect game happens, and I'm actually driving back. Mike Mordecai, oh, nice. who was a former Brave player. Now he's a coach, I believe, still in the Blue Jays minor league system. Hmm. So I'm driving him back to the ballpark, uh, back to the hotel, and we're just BSing and, you know, talking about some stuff. He brings up Moda. Hmm. <laughs> and, and we start talking and laughing. And he said something about how he missed the bus. I was like, uh, yeah. He goes, wait a minute. Don't tell me you drove him. <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, oh, great. This is fantastic. Now we got something to hang him and kangaroo court with. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh. so. so that was that was kind of a highlight there. Yeah, so you not only got the drive two players, but you actually got one so they can bust this balls during kangaroo court in the locker room afterwards. That's, that's a pretty, and, and a perfect game of it, so that's a pretty interesting story. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yeah, very cool. Alright, also, other news in the MPB, um, and you and I had spoken about this. There, some, the MPB games, and looks like it's only, I'll uh, Double check whether it was was the Pacific Division or the Central Division. They will be on, aired on a network called NHK Japan. Now, folks, I don't know about the situation where you live, where I live here in Baltimore, Eric. NHK Japan is not only on most cable systems; it is also a digital over-air channel. Here in our area, it's run by a lot of the public television stations, like the it's like an affiliate of M. We call it Maryland Public Television, but it's PBS basically. And I've watched, I've watched that network a few times. It's like usually it's mostly a news network, and they have some interest stories. The only sports I had seen on there was I saw like one thing about when Japan was in the World Cup, and I think they also air sumo wrestling matches on there. But now they will be airing NPB live in the well. They say live, but as you had commented in our our one of our Facebook groups, it's not really live, it's just b delayed broadcast, you know, for, to make them air airtime friendly for American audiences. Um, this is an article, right. according to that particular network, NHK World Japan. People in the U.S. will be able to watch Japanese pro games live on cable TV and the internet soon. For the... For the fans, Sports Channel will broadcast more than 200 official Pacific League games featuring 16s between August and November. Amid the coronavirus pandemic, sports-related companies around the world are looking at business models that don't involve spectators watching games at stadiums. The distributor of Pacific League games says it plans to enhance TV and online services. Pacific League marketing CEO Nagishi Tomoki says he wants to continue to explore new ways to promote Japanese professional baseball. So that's definitely good news. I, because I think the times are like seven thirty Eastern East Coast time here in the U.S. So it's it, so it's pretty much it's like an air version of the Twitch broadcast on KBO. You can you know it's delayed and you can watch them at a more friendly time. You know so that's good. I think that's good news. I think some of our listeners here in the U.S. would enjoy that. Actually, and I'm not sure how exactly the contract runs, but it's on my cable system. It's not on NHK. It's on a channel called um, One World Sports. Hmm. And I think they're in the process 
of changing hands because they actually have a Twitch network and it's called For the Fans. So I think the channel itself is actually going to be changing its call letters, so to speak. Okay. So they are showing the games on this uh, For the Fans network, which for Verizon Fios customers, it's channel 597. Mm -hmm. uh, they're showing their games on the way with no commentary. Hmm. So all you're hearing are the fans cheering and the songs and everything else. You're not getting any sort of broadcast uh, from the Japanese, which, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's missing a little something, but if you're just going for the fan atmosphere, right. that's the way to go. And I think, but, I, I, I think I would enjoy that, actually, after what you and I and others have said about the ESPN Talking Heads on the KBO broadcast, I would actually welcome that. I mean, it's like, I actually enjoy the commentary in the Korean language on the Twitch KBO broadcast better for that reason. And although, I did read somewhere in the group where some people asked if their announcers ramble a lot like ours do, and some of them said, yeah, sometimes worse. But, <laughs> but they... Oh, I'm sure they do. Yeah. But you know what? It, it's kind of the thing where I don't care what kind of a language it's in. It, to me, it, it makes it more exciting to hear somebody in a different language, even if you can't understand them. Right. And that's one thing that surprised me about KBO, is how many English language baseball terms there are, so you can still kind of follow the context of the game, pretty much. And it's, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it'd be weird, you would, you would recognize a player's name, and then you would hear one ball, one strike, you know, and, it's, and then, one, I think the only... I think Korean terms I've heard for baseball terms, I heard Sanjin for strikeout, and there was another one that Daniel Kim said on a broadcast for base hit. And I think even the ESPN announcers were asking him, now, is that for any base hit, or is that for a single, or what that was? And I forget what he had said after that, but... but Yeah, they, they kind of have that in Taiwan, uh, where the base hit is banda, and uh, then the double... And triple. Uh, the the no, the translation for two is er, so they add er lay on the mm -hmm. for like a for like a t uh, double hit, and then san lay on the for a triple. Okay. The term for a strikeout is sanjen. Oh, okay. Which is over to the Korean, and the term for a home run is chile da. Oh, wow, okay. Well, so, kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Definitely learn more and more on this program, so definitely. Oh. All right, so we will, with that, we will go to the standings in the NPB. We will start with, I believe, with the Pacific Division. I think usually, I think they list the Pacific first and then the Central, and let's double check on that. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Come on. <laughs> Here we go. No, they start with the central. I apologize for that. Which kind of... It kind of surprises me that they're pushing the Pacific Division because it seemed like a lot of the teams in the central division are like the bigger market teams. A lot of them like the... several Tokyo teams in Hiroshima and things like that. But we'll go to the central division. We'll start with the Yomiuri Giants who are at 27, 17, and 3. Followed by the Yokohama Bay Stars at 25, 23, and 2. The Hanshin Tigers at 22, 23, and 3. The Yakut Swallows, who threw the no-hitter against the Bay Stars at 21, 22, and 5. The Tanisi Dragons at 21, 26, and 4. And the Hiroshima Carp at 19, 24, and 5. Moving on to the Pacific Division. The Fukuoka South Bank Hawks at 29, 20, and 1. The Rocketon Golden Eagles at 27, 21, and 2. The Chiba Lote Marines at 27, 22, and 1. The Nippon Ham Fighters at 24, 24, and 2. The Saibu Lions at 20, 26, and 1. And finally, the Oryx Buffaloes at 16, 30, and 3. Adam Jones Bobblehead still available. Anyway. Alright, so. Which actually, actually, if you talk to your friend, Eric. Eric, if you talk to your friend about that, let him know how much he wants. I might actually 
I'm gonna hit him up for one of those. But anyway, uh, I, be- I believe the price is forty. Okay. U.S. And as I might have said to you during another either BS session or possibly another show, the shipping tends to be a little expensive. Mm. But whoever he uses, it literally gets to me in three days. Okay. So it definitely justifies it. Right. Okay. So maybe, I don't know, maybe it's like an express rate with DHL or whoever you get it from. I don't know. Uh, well, it's, it's it's some sort of Japanese company that he uses. I believe it's Express something something. I hmm. forget off the top of my head. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, but when you can get but when you can get turnaround time in three days, packed perfectly, you know, with bubble wrap or whatever. Right. I'll pay the extra. Yeah, definitely. Just to get it here safe. Yeah, and you and, and I were talking off the air about. Companies and not especially doing that. with the Japanese players, mm-hmm. when they see somebody from the U.S. with their items, they get a kick out of it. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I mean, this this year specifically with the Rays new farmhand uh, Yoshi Tsutsugo, I had ordered two pieces of his, and it got to the point where not only did I get them signed. But my picture got taken for a Japanese website with him and the bobbleheads within the picture. And it's on, I believe, his website. Oh, okay. So these guys get a kick out of it. Okay, cool. So what he mentioned you... from a different country Mm -hmm. has their materials. Right. So he mentioned you on the website saying thanks, Eric Meyerbach, and, you know, for... Being my U.S. fan, or, or how did that? How did that go? Was it? No, well, the, the writer actually put it on his uh, on his website. Oh wow! Okay, you so know, I guess an article. I guess it's like uh, American fans, you know, appreciate something, something, and that's how you know it ties in with the international uh, game, so to speak. Oh, okay, I've had that happen in the KBO with uh, KKK. Obviously, with the Yankees, with Chen Wong, it it just gets to be a whole international phenomenon, sure thing. Hmm. And and as you mentioned many times with the Taiwan players, that's how you re- that's how you were recognized as a celebrity over there when you went to games eventually. So that's that, that's cool. It's a lot of good stories, so you know. Yeah, a million stories in this naked city. Hmm, definitely, and even abroad. Yeah, and around, yeah, definitely, definitely around the world. Baseball, get everybody home safe, you know. Heck with it. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Well, Eric, do you have any other news about our friends in the MPB? Because I have another story about a new country we haven't discussed yet. Are, are you talking Russia? Yep. Yes, I'm Sarah Palin. I can see baseball from my window. Yep. We have a story. I'm impressed. Yeah, there we go. You have a story for that window afterwards. That's what I want to know. Well, I don't know. Some of the things she sees out of there, I don't know if I'd want to, because it seems like she sees some cool stuff. But anyway. <laughs> um, we have a story from the World Baseball Softball Confederation. And it says a new baseball stadium inaugurated in Moscow, Russia, as season opens. A new stadium in Moscow, Russia, is a sign that baseball and softball are growing more and more popular as the sport continues its global expansion. Moscow has the current honor of having the newest baseball stadium in the world. And with the new venue, the top baseball league in Russia opened its 2020 season on Saturday, August 8th. The Russian Baseball Federation issued COVID-19 prevention guidelines modeled on WBSC recommendations. Umpires will wear gloves and face masks during the games, and only half of the seats can be filled with fans in order to allow for social distancing. All the players have so far tested negative for COVID-19. It's very important that Russian baseball championship remains on track without any disruption, said RBF President Dmitry Kiselev. Quote, we are doing our best to ensure the health of everyone involved, not only players, coaches, umpires, and scorers, but also organizers, staff, reporters, and spectators. RBF announced that the eight-team championship will conclude its regular season in two weeks. 
The top four finishers will advance to the championship round, set to begin on Saturday, August the 22nd. All the games will be played at the new Roots Star Arena in Moscow. The Roots Star Arena is the home of the Russian national team and a high standard baseball venue. It was selected as the venue of the Baseball European Championship Group B and the Under-23 European Baseball Championship Qualifier. Both tournaments were postponed to 2021 by the Confederation of European Baseball because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Fans who won't be able to access the games will have the chance to watch them online through the Roostar Arena YouTube channel. So Eric, I know you scan the globe and you scan the internet for games all over the world. Have you had a chance to see any of these games in Russia yet? No. No. Uh, the only the only thing that I've seen in Russia, uh, and they do have them on YouTube, are the KHL, which is the Russian Hockey League, mm. which is obviously during hockey season, mm. October to, I believe, March. Right. The one thing that I like about baseball being back in Russia, and the reason why I say back was they actually tried some sort of a federation back in the late 80s where there was a team of, of Russians that were trying to make it and they did like an international barnstorming tour of some minor league teams in the U.S. I know uh, they did have part of it in the Albany, New York area uh -huh. and I I think they tried some of the teams in the Penn League as well. I don't remember how it how it went, but there were like thirty to forty guys that were doing this barnstorming thing. As a matter of fact, they actually put out a baseball card set from that league. That's how I kind of well, from that team. That's how I kind of remember it. But I'm glad to see that Russians are trying to get back into that game again because who knows. I mean, they flourished in the hockey. Maybe they can get their way back into baseball as well. That would be interesting to see. And I have seen the KEHL. I, yeah, their their games are phenomenal. I actually, I think I have a jersey. I don't know if the team is still in existence or not. They're they're called um, Ter I think they're called Torpedo Yaroslav, which basically their that city was kind of, from what I was told, is kind of like. Russia's version of Detroit, a big automotive industry in that particular fact, you know, automotive factory industry in that city. And the okay. jersey was actually pretty cool. It actually has like a backward R um, as part of their logo and inside, and the R is inside of like a gear. And the jersey itself is like covered with all these gears throughout it. And, you know, it's mixed with, and it's a weird color scheme of, of Black, purple, and red, I think. And, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm doing the jersey justice, but the jersey itself looked really cool. I managed to get it. It was like this one discount store chain was selling a bunch of different Bauer Russian Hockey League jerseys, and that was one of them. I got for like 10 bucks. And, actually, I was in a roller hockey league at, at that same time. A team in our league bought a bunch of jerseys from a team called Moscow Kiev, and I... They actually call themselves Moscow Kiev just so they can buy those cheap hockey jerseys and, you know, skate around in them. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> but, oh, wow. Yeah. So good for our friends for Russia. Another country we can thank for giving us free baseball to look on our, wet, our laptops or our phones or wherever. Um, all right. Well, Eric, this... This show, I think we're making up for lost time because we had like our shortest show last week. This week, we're over two hours of baseball, but we had a lot of news to cover, a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. Um, do you have any further comments about Russia or any of the other leagues or anything else we haven't covered yet? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm glad we did get Russia in there. Okay. The other leagues, um, you know, they're small. They're few and far between. The coverage isn't that wonderful. If you want, we can give some links so that people that are interested in some of the leagues uh, can actually access them and check out how their favorite
other teams are doing. But since neither of us really know about them, there's mm-hmm. maybe two minutes of each week per month. Well, yeah, maybe. Um, and, yeah, that, I think that's an excellent idea. I will get with you off the air as far as which links to post, because I think a lot of our audience in the KB on the Pacific, I mean, they may already know about, you know, the leagues for Japan and stuff, but for, like, these Russia leagues and these Italy leagues and the Dutch honkball leagues and stuff like that, I think that people would definitely benefit from that. And another way we can benefit from folks is from you. If you like the show, like our channel, like the show, subscribe, tell your friends, watch it again and again, boost those doggone numbers so Eric and I can cover more baseball for you. And meanwhile, Eric and I will do our best to look for this, do what the wide world of sports used to do, span the globe for the interesting variety of sports. All right. I refuse to fall off skis, though. I beg your pardon? The agony of defeat. Oh, yeah. I said I refuse to fall off skis, though, in the agony of defeat. That makes two of us, for sure. (laughs) All right, fans. Thank you for joining us. And as we end every week, there's the old saying about it's not over till the fat lady sings. On this show, it's not over until the NC Dinos cheerleaders dance. So thank you for joining us. We'll talk to you next week.